Okay, good morning, good afternoon, hello, and welcome on behalf of Meridian Valley Lab to the webinar on allergy testing in clinical practice. This is Caitlin Nguyen from Marketing at Meridian Valley. There is a change in presenters today due to Dr. Leah Paz, um, who's lost her voice. Um, we hope that she will get her voice back soon. Today's webinar will be presented by Dr. Michael Kaplan, one of the consulting physicians here at the lab. Dr. Kaplan graduated from Bastyr University in 2005 and is a board-certified naturopathic physician. Dr. Kaplan operated a successful practice in Seattle, focusing on chronic inflammatory and autoimmune diseases. He now brings his expertise in functional medicine to Meridian Valley Lab where he consults with other physicians on the safe and effective use of bioidentical hormones. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar um, by typing in your questions and Dr. Kaplan will answer them either during or after the webinar. Your participation is strongly encouraged. Uh, you may want to refer to your webinar notes and sample report which was emailed to you yesterday to assist you in this webinar. For those of you who registered a little bit later, we will be sending that in an email to you so you have it. And now I would like to turn the webinar over to Dr. Kaplan. Thank you, Caitlin, and welcome everybody. Welcome to GoToWebinar, Web Events Made Easy. Pardon me, everybody. We had some technical difficulties. We are back online right now. Okay. So, as I was saying, it's estimated that over half of Americans have food allergies, and this has been a phenomenon that has been on the rise over the last half century or so. We estimate that one of the reasons for an increased prevalence of uh, food allergies has to do to a couple of factors. One, the increase in early exposure to common allergens such as cow's milk. Also, wheat and soy are, uh, are culprit food allergens that are being introduced at a younger and younger age to our children. In addition, uh, the increased use of antibiotics, which can alter the normal intestinal flora, may have a, a role in the increased incidence and prevalence of food allergies. Uh, symptoms, of course, can be very uh, nonspecific and can vary widely. So there are two different types of antibodies that we talk about when we look at food allergies. First, the IgE-mediated food reactions. This would be the immediate or type 1 hypersensitivity reactions, um, manifesting most commonly in hives, wheezes, runny nose, vomiting, and of course, anaphylaxis. Then we have our delayed type auto uh, hypersensitivity reaction, characterized by IgG antibodies. And this type of reaction can be less obvious, more subclinical, and chronic, manifesting in symptoms such as headache, digestive complaints, musculoskeletal symptoms, skin disorders, eczema, and others. At Meridian Valley Lab, we measure both IgE and the IgG4 subclass of the IgG antibody. So the FDA has looked into food allergies, and there's quite a bit of research and documentation on the subject now. And according to the U.S. government, more than 160 foods can cause allergic reactions. We have a list here of some very common foods. You can call them the usual suspects, if you like, accounting for the vast majority of food allergies. And by law, many of these have to be listed on ingredient labels. They include milk, eggs, fish, crustaceans, tree nuts, meaning almonds, walnuts, and pecans. Peanuts, of course, that's a big one. Wheat, 
and soybeans. I'd like to talk to you now about some food allergy studies in the research, uh, as I hinted about it a second ago. Here's an interesting one. In children, we find that kids who are overweight are more likely to have an elevated IgG reaction or antibody titer to foods when compared to normal weight children. Another study showed an increased IgG antibodies to foods, especially cow's milk, in children with chronic diarrhea. Upon eliminating the indicated foods based upon the food allergy results, symptoms improved in 65 of the 82 children in the study. Looking at some other conditions, we come to migraines. We have a study here that discusses 56 patients tested for IgG antibodies and a statistically significant number of these patients were uh, found to be positive for IgG food-related antibodies as compared to controls. When these same patients underwent elimination diets based upon their positive IgG tests, they found to have symptom relief without the use of pharmaceuticals. So not saying that food allergies is the one and only cause of migraines, far from, but this could be an important adjunct to your migraine treatment plan. Now here we come to something that's um, perhaps a little bit more commonly associated with food allergies, at least in the mainstream, and that's irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS. We have a study here that describes 25 participants with IBS that underwent IgG food allergy testing. They were positive, as you may expect, for a number of foods, including milk, eggs, cheese, tomatoes, yeast, and others. They eliminated the allergenic foods for six months, and the participants reported significantly reduced IBS-related symptoms and, more importantly, improved quality of life. If any of you have worked with patients with irritable bowel syndrome, you know that it's not just a list of symptoms on a checklist. It's these people, uh, these patients are suffering mightily and their quality of life uh, deteriorates uh, concomitantly. So this is something that um, can bring about a better quality and better enjoyment of their life. So differing types of food allergy tests that are available. First and foremost, we have the serum testing that uses the ELISA method. That's what we offer at Meridian Valley Lab. There are also skin tests, the RAST test, uh, the allergy elimination diet, which you would do in the office, stool gluten testing, which can be uh, that which measures IgA antibodies to gluten and gliadin and also anti-tissue transglutaminase. Slightly different than food allergy but uh, for certain worth mentioning. And then of course um, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the, the usefulness and the availability of a blood panel for celiac disease. So we spoke about a few conditions or diseases that were related to food allergies, but here is a more extensive list, certainly not exhaustive, but beginning with ADHD and autism, some behavioral uh, uh, conditions, um, alcoholism, anxiety, arthritis, and of course rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, some more inflammatory conditions, candidiasis, chronic fatigue, and chronic infections from any source. Any sort of chronic gastrointestinal condition, we mentioned IBS, but also colitis, constipation, and diarrhea. Cravings and eating disorders. Now this is an interesting one because while there is certainly an association between food allergies and eating disorders, these patients may exhibit triggered symptoms by treatment methodologies that focus on restriction. So please proceed very cautiously when considering a food allergy workup with patients with eating disorders. 
We also have patients with depression, irritability and mood swings, fatigue, fluid retention, brain fog, gas and bloating, gout, migraines as we mentioned before, hives, hyperactivity related to possibly ADHD, hypoglycemia, leaky gut syndrome, leaky and irritable bladder, multiple sclerosis, obsessive compulsive disorders, PMS, uh, poor absorption nutrient deficiencies that goes with leaky gut syndrome, seizures, skin problems, Tourette's syndrome, and others. Here at Meridian Valley Lab, our ELISA serum test comes in a variety of flavors, if you will. We have our basic food allergy panel, we call that the E95 panel, tests for 95 foods. Then we also offer an extended panel, which we call the A95, which also includes an array of spices. We have a newer test that is a finger stick test, we call it the food safe test, and it tests for the same foods measured by the basic E95 panel. And we also offer an inhalant allergy panel. And this can be done uh, according to your specific region. Worth mentioning again that the E95 and the A95 are combination IgE and IgG4 panels. The food safe finger stick test is an IgG4 panel. We also offer the stool IgA test for gluten and as a celiac disease blood panel as well. Here's a look at the kits that we use for the two main panels, the E95 and the A95. Those are done with standard venipuncture, as you can see in the picture on your left. You can see a couple of uh, serum separator tubes as well as a biohazard bag for return of the specimen. And then that box in the background is a, a handy um, shipper that uh, delivers all of the supplies to you. On the right we have the food safe kit which can be done at home. It's very very convenient. Uh, the finger stick of course is accomplished with included lancets and this is also a great test to consider whenever venipuncture is inconvenient for whatever reason. Both kits uh, come to you as a practitioner uh, free of charge and the shipping is overnight free of charge if you are a practitioner. So a bit more about the food allergy uh, food safe finger stick test. As I mentioned does not require venipuncture. It's easy to do at home. Uh, there's a quick turnaround, uh, very cost effective and we actually have a demo um, describing the methodology for the finger stick collection process on our website. Also, this is a great test for your pediatric patients. Again, not always possible or convenient to do venipuncture in that patient population. Here is a quick review of the ELISA method that we use to process these food allergy tests. So, we begin with the food antigen and we add your blood sample to that. The blood, of course, contains antibodies that react to the food antigen in our in vitro setup here. Then we wash out the extra blood, so we're left with the antibody antigen complex here. We add additional anti-antibodies, -anti and then we're going to add a detector to detect this the antibodies to the immune complexes that were already formed from your specimen and our original food antigen. We're going to add a developer and then of course we're going to stop this process from overdeveloping and you can see the nice purple color. The purple color is read by a very high-tech piece of equipment and you get a result which we're going to look at in just a moment. Now here's a quick glance at the foods that we're going to test for on the E95 or basic food panel. As you can see there's a dairy group, a meat group, a fish group, 
a shellfish group, a list of grains, vegetables, which is quite extensive, fruits, nuts, and some other miscellaneous foods. Here's our extended or A95 panel. There are some additional dairy items, some additional grains, additional fruits, nuts, vegetables, and you can see this extended list of spices. Both panels, meaning the A95 and the E95, can be combined for a grand total of 190 foods. And then here is a glance at the food safe or finger stick food panel uh, list of foods that we test for. It's essentially the same as the E95 or basic panel. All right, let's discuss some cases. And I will answer your questions in just a moment. So we begin with Richard, who's a 16-year-old male with a nonspecific rash. Let's take a look at what Richard's got going on. So the rash initially appeared after gardening. Uh, he describes extreme itchiness with a little bit of pain, some papules that ooze. He used some topical cortisone cream, which helped a little bit, but the rash eventually returned. He saw his primary care physician, a dermatologist who consulted with an allergist. Um, neither of them were able to determine the etiology or the cause of the rash. Objective examination revealed vitals within normal limits. We have here a vesicular rash covering fingers, palms, forearms, knees, and elbows with a sparse scattering of uh, diffuse, diffuse lesions on the thighs and abdomen. So our diagnosis uh, is a little nonspecific at the moment. Some further workup is going to be required, but what we've got here is a vesicular rash covering those parts of the body. And our DDX includes dermatitis herpetiformis, dyshydrotic eczema, and herpes simplex. In terms of our plan, we're going to uh, culture the vesicles and perform a skin scraping. We're going to run an HSV antibody panel. We're going to test this person for celiac disease. Um, via the serum, and we're going to run an E95 basic food allergy panel from Meridian Valley Lab. So here is Richard's E95 basic food panel. You can see here that our test result page has three categories, low, moderate, and avoid. Anything that comes classified in the moderate or avoid category would be characterized as not safe. So we have some moderate reactivity in the dairy group, and we have some severe reactivity to egg white and egg yolk. So eggs, unfortunately, one of our usual suspects. Um, Richard is going to have to take a look at his egg consumption. We also have some moderate reaction to gluten. Um, this does not mean that he has celiac disease. It may very well mean that he has a non-celiac type of gluten sensitivity, which there have been a number of research papers about within the last 18 months. On the second group here, still within the E95, Richard had a severe reaction to garlic. So we have some things to go by here. We also performed an inhalant panel that was keyed to the Pacific Northwest region because that's where Richard lives. And in this case, we had uh, negative results. So it looks like food is going to be one of the primary aspects that we're going to focus on in the treatment plan. So upon uh, dietary and lifestyle counseling, Richard eliminated the specified foods and the rash nicely resolved for him. Also implemented some digestive support to ameliorate any inflammation that was going on in his digestive system. Of course, we, we shouldn't forget that the, the net reactivity that comes from food allergies comes from not only the exposure 
to the offending food, but also the health of the gastrointestinal system. We can't forget that part. And then we uh, repeat, repeated the test several months later, and in this case, we show a, a decrease in the relative antibody load. So in this case, the overall dairy reaction declined a little bit. The egg white is still in the avoid category, but the egg yolk declined into the moderate category. The garlic declined into the moderate category. So these are foods that Richard is going to have to be very careful with, but as we can see, the decline in his overall antibodies is a very positive thing for his health. Let's take a look at a second case. We have a gentleman named Arnold. He's 62 years old, and he has uncontrolled diabetes. Now, wait a minute. Why are we talking about why are we talking about diabetes in a food allergy discussion? Um, and and again, um, thank you so much for your questions. I will I will answer them just uh, in just a moment. Um, we have uh, when we have a situation whenever blood sugar is raging out of control, we need to take a look at the total stressors that are on the organism. And we can't forget that food allergies are a very significant stressor that the body deals with in the same way that the body deals with any other stressor, and that would be with cortisol, with epinephrine. And these two hormones um, increase blood sugar. So, of course, anybody that we have blood sugar issues, metabolic syndrome, or frank diabetes, we're going to treat them with all the basic dietary and lifestyle modifications that you might think about and all of the blood sugar um, nutrients and pharmaceuticals that might be indicated. But in this case, we're suggesting that you consider taking a look at food allergies in these patients. Let's go ahead and take a look at Arnold's case. So I mentioned that he's 62 years old. He also is presenting with fatigue, weight gain, and vision changes. He's also reporting some mood swings and mild depression. So he's, he, overall, he's just not well. He's craving sugar, not a surprise, and he gets tired after eating. He also reports some mild reflux, and he drinks quite a bit of coffee. Objective examination reveals mild hypertension, and he has a, a fairly significant amount of truncal adiposity. He has uh, some puffy bags under his eyelids. He has cataracts, um, thankfully no fundoscopic changes. He also has some increased um, fat deposits at the back of his neck. He's grumpy and a little bit out of sorts. And he has decreased sensation on the plantar surface of his foot. Okay, our assessment is a 62-year-old male with undiagnosed diabetes, and he's consuming a standard American diet. Our plan is to run a glucose and insulin tolerance test. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Hemoglobin A1C, a lipid panel, and a comprehensive metabolic panel to go with that. We're going to do some diet and exercise counseling, but we're also going to run a food allergy panel. Okay, I mentioned this insulin and glucose tolerance test. This is a test that we offer here at Meridian Valley Lab that can be useful to gauge the severity of the overall blood glucose dysregulation. And specifically, aside from glucose, we're also looking at insulin. And the, as, you, as, as you can see here, we create a graph over time that measures both glucose and insulin at baseline and then after a glucose challenge. And as you can see here, we have a dramatic spike in insulin at the two-hour mark. So not surprising, Arnold has insulin resistance to go along with his blood sugar dysregulation and diabetes. Here is the E95 basic food allergy panel that uh, Arnold had done. He had some significant reactivity in the dairy group. 
also egg whites were a problem, almonds, and we had some moderate reactivity in the vegetable group, notably um, green beans and kidney beans. Okay, Arnold underwent a food allergen elimination protocol based upon these results, and he had a significant improvement in his energy, his neuropathy, and his blood sugar. His hemoglobin improved, and his insulin returned to normal. Now, this is notable because insulin resistance is associated with inflammation, it's associated with atherosclerosis, it's, it's associated with an increase in aromatase activity, which modulates the conversion of androgens to estrogen. High insulin on a chronic basis is very, very detrimental. It's at least as detrimental as high blood sugar. So the fact that his insulin re curve returned to normal is a very notable result. His vision maintained at a current level, which was positive in that it did not get worse, and he lost quite a bit of weight as well. Let's take a look at one more case here, a 32-year-old female named Molly with irritable bowel syndrome. Molly has a 15-year history of stool urgency, meaning she's having 12 to 15 bowel movements a day. So talk about a quality of life impairment. She has many stool accidents and unfortunately cannot go anywhere without checking out where the bathroom is ahead of time. She has serious bowel cramping and she also has explosive stool that um, complicates her situation significantly. On objective exam, vitals were with normal, within normal limits. She had a mild increase in belly fat, and her bowel sounds were uh, increased in all four quadrants. Palpation uh, yielded no pain. Her colon was easily palpable, no hepatosplenomegaly. On her dermis, she had multiple nevi, and all other symptoms, or excuse me, symptoms were within um, normal limits. So, looks like she is a likely candidate for IBS. Now, typically IBS is a diagnosis of exclusion. She, it's, she has a previous diagnosis from a gastroenterologist of Crohn's disease. So, that also came up in the history and is possibly flaring at the moment as well. So, in terms of our plan, we're going to take a look at some antispasmodics. Uh, there's a particular herb called cramp bark, which is very effective for this. There was also some dietary counseling for uh, blood sugar. And Molly was counseled to avoid nightshades, which can be particularly an issue for people dealing with Crohn's disease. Um, fish is was recommended as a, a main dietary source of protein for its anti-inflammatory fatty acid profile and we also ordered of course a food allergy panel. Now for this particular patient they had not really done an, ex an examination or an investigation of the food allergy component in the past so this was an important piece for Molly. Taking a look at her results she is high in multiple categories. So not terribly surprising, the state of her gastrointestinal system is, is most assuredly in ill health. Molly was counseled to undergo a food allergen elimination diet. And um, she had a fairly significant reduction in her overall stool urgency and frequency. She even was able to take a trip with her family and was not impacted by the overwhelming and life-altering sense of stool urgency that she was battling with. Upon reintroduction of the offending foods, she does um, seem to have some return of symptoms. So. That is going to need to be managed on an ongoing basis.
and with symptoms being relatively under control, she is motivated to um, return and to employ methods to facilitate further gut healing. And I know there was a question about that. We'll discuss that in just a moment. So with that, um, we've presented a number of uh, situations and some evidence and some compelling cases that um, should uh, lead you to consider food allergy testing for the health of your patients. So let's go ahead and answer some of some questions now. Okay, first question is, can you talk about why we test for IgG4, the, the subclass of IgG known as IgG4, and not IgG1? We find clinically that IgG4 reacts more to food allergens and correlates very strongly with symptoms and then symptom amelioration upon a food elimination plan that is informed by the, the, the results of the food allergy test. What type of digestive support uh, are we talking about in general? Well, there's a few things that one can consider. Um, probiotics seem very, very important in terms of restoring normal flora to the intestines. Um, there's a number of reasons why flora may be compromised. Um, we have the abundance of antibiotics used in um, mainstream and, and um, complementary and alternative medicine for that matter as well. And the overuse of antibiotics has led to not only antibiotic resistance but also um, um, detrimental consequences to the immune system based upon the lack of these beneficial flora. In addition, there are some factors and uh, nutrients that are very important for healing the gastrointestinal um, membranes. We have glutamine, which is an important nitrogen donor for enterocytes. We have uh, uh, dietary um, digestive enzymes, which while they don't have a direct impact on the viability of the uh, gastrointestinal cells, what they do is they make sure that when the food arrives in the small intestine, they're adequately digested so that inappropriately large particles do not reach those enterocytes and result in further inflammation and furthering a leaky gut um, situation. That would be um, the, a, a key triad for any type of digestive support that you might consider. In addition, it's important to consider um, other factors that decrease systemic inflammation, such as fatty acid modification, specifically um, omega-3s and the anti-inflammatory subset of omega-6s. Next question, how long, or a, how long after the first test do we repeat the food allergy again? That is an excellent question. And I would say that a safe uh, interval to repeat the test in general would be four to six months. Now sometimes the elimination phase that would result from these food allergy tests um, may need to take significantly longer than four to six months. Sometimes uh, we're thinking about a year in terms of the total amount of time needed to uh, clear antibodies and also affect the necessary gut healing. Um, but it's oftentimes useful to show a patient from an objective point of view that their antibody load is decreasing um, they may be feeling better, but sometimes it's nice to objectify the, their improved condition by showing them the improvement in their antibodies that come about along the way. Okay, another question here. Would you comment on cross-reactivities between inhalants and foods? That is another interesting question, and as a matter of fact, there is a, a study 
that I just came across very recently that looked at the relationship between IgG antibodies to foods and IgEs um, not only to foods and inhalants. Um, this particular study found that IgG antibodies to foods were elevated in patients far before they were positive for IgE. So in some cases, um, reactivity to foods may precede um, reactivity to IgE both in food and inhalants. Now, at a very basic level, um, the, the term cross-reactivity implies a, a, an immune target that addresses one particular antigen or epitope that in a chronic situation kind of switches over and becomes uh, targeted to another antigenic epitope. That certainly can happen between uh, inhalants and foods. I would say that one of the use utilities of the inhalant panel is you're able to see the reactivity in both categories. Decreasing the total body burden in the food category would almost assuredly reduce the, uh, the overall body burden in the inhalant category, especially when it comes to um, an, immune, an immunogenicity point of view. So important to deal with both inhalants and foods. Next question. What would you do with a patient who has done the E95, A95 test, eliminated the food allergens, and the eczema symptoms are not getting any better? This is a phenomenon that we see, do see from time to time in clinical practice. Eczema, in particular, is an extremely challenging uh, condition for patients and doctors alike. So in this situation, we always want to consider what what else might be going on. So while food allergies certainly may be central to any um, in skin inflammatory situation, it's important to take a look at environmental allergens, and I'm not just talking about inhalants. Um, uh, uh, soaps, shampoos, detergents, um, both laundry and otherwise may be important to take a look at. Um, other mediators of inflammation in the body, um, such as a lack of vitamin D, uh, may be important. We mentioned earlier the importance of modulating a person's fatty acid profile toward a more anti-inflammatory direction. That would be important for somebody with eczema. And then also, it's very important to take a look at the um, stress and um, overall, um, well, I should just say simply the, the amount of stress that a person is under because a chronic stress can definitely exacerbate inflammation. And as a matter of fact, there have been a number of uh, studies done between psoriasis, vitamin D, and mindfulness meditation. And what was found was while vitamin D improved the psoriasis, the mindfulness meditation that was targeted as a stress reduction method brought about further decreases in the psoriasis. So eczema, a multifactorial situation to be sure. When going on an elimination diet, should the patient return to a rotation diet after a certain amount of time? So this um, is a great question. This um, is important um, to address because upon elimination, many patients feel better. The question becomes what to do when it's time to reintroduce the food. Many times a rotation diet after a period of time provided there was no initial reactivity when the food was reintroduced the, for the first time after the elimination diet um, can be something that would allow the patient to continue to eat those problematic foods in moderation. Rotation diets um, would be contraindicated when 
there is a significant uh, reactivity to a food after the elimination phase. So rotation would be, um, I would say, something to consider when there's no reaction to a food after an elimination phase or there is very, very mild, exceptionally mild reaction to a food. Rotation diets can be appropriate in those situations as well. Basically what's going on here is we still have antibodies to the offending food, but in very limited, infrequent quantities, that food may still be able to be consumed. One other um, ameliorating factor, of course, would be the amount of gastrointestinal healing you're able to impart to your patient. Uh, that certainly would improve the odds that the rotation diet would be something that could be sustainable in the long term. Next question. Info on food allergy indicates IgG and IgE testing and allergy panels. Uh, let's see. Um, you know, I'm, the question is not clear to me. So the question that asks about info on food allergy indicates IgG and IgE testing. Um, could you please re rephrase your question? I'm not sure what you what you mean. I'm going to move on. We'll come back to that. The A95. Um, for the for the one of the previous cases in or in general of course includes IgE and IgG testing how do you know when a patient has an IgE or IgG reaction to foods a very good question so IgE uh, antibodies are of course uh, immediate or type 1 hypersensitivity reactions so um, the overwhelming majority of people who have IG, IgE reactions typically know it because they're experiencing some symptoms such as hives, such as um, constriction in the throat, um, uh, such as uh, tight, uh, tightness in the chest, difficulty breathing, um, or even, heaven forbid, a full-blown anaphylaxis. The IgG mediated reactions are going to be far more nonspecific, they're going to be far more insidious, they're going to be far more subclinical. They're going to be reactions that could be multifactorial in, or, in origin, such as diarrhea, such as uh, joint pain. So um, the, the difference in terms of clinical presentation between IgE or IgE um, is, is pretty marked. Okay. So here's a person that just wanted a little bit of clarification. Are we checking IgE, IgEs in the panels? Yes, we are checking both IgG and IgE in the basic food allergy panel, which we call E95, the extended food allergy panel, which we call A95. Those are both venipuncture tests. In our food safe finger stick blood spot test, we only test for IgG. Do we test for, do we test only IgG? Um, oh, and then another person. Okay, the, the question being clarified. Thank you for clarifying your, your previous question. Um, again, uh, we do include both IgG and IgE antibodies in the venipuncture test that we offer. And here's a follow-up question. Because the IgE is more or less obvious, why then is it included in A95? Well, it's really included for sake of comprehensiveness. Um, sometimes it's necessary to document the reactivity um, just from a sheer objective point of view. And it can be helpful, especially uh, moving forward in terms of a patient's records that they have a documented reaction even if it is the IgE more, more clinically obvious type. Okay, here's another question regarding the inhalant allergy panels. Do we test for both IgG and IgE? Um, we only test the IgEs in the food um, inhalant, excuse me, in the inhalant panels. So only IgE in the inhalant panels. Very excellent questions. 
Okay, another one rolls in. Would you comment on the now well-known study on the value of elimination diets in ADHD in which IgG did not correlate with the problematic foods? Um, in, in, in general, when we're talking about um, um, a, a, a condition such as ADHD, um, it's important to, to know that um, there are many avenues that need to be addressed clinically. Now, even though in that particular study, IgG did not correlate with problematic foods, um, we, we have to think clinically about the state of the person's gastrointestinal system. Um, it, it's, it's, it's well known clinically that in, in ADHD and also in autism, we find that both children and adults have some measure of inflammation, have some measure of um, compromise in their gastrointestinal system, and so therefore the gastrointestinal healing side of the treatment equation would probably need to be emphasized here. Are you using immunocap for the IgE testing? Um, that is a, a question that I'm not particularly sure of the answer to. So um, in a moment I will uh, I'll give you an email address um, that you could email me and I would be happy to give you the answer to that upon some further research. Okay, another question. What are nightshades? Nightshades are a group of foods that include the following. Tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, mushrooms, uh, bell peppers, and others. And these foods can be problematic um, in a number of uh, conditions. Um, we mentioned Crohn's disease, but also rheumatoid arthritis. Um, those patients notoriously have a problem with nightshades. Are there any other questions at this time? Okay. With regard to the question about immunocap, um, please um, go ahead and email me your contact info at info at meridianvalleylab.com. Again, info at meridianvalleylab.com, and I will most assuredly get you the, the answer to that. Okay, this concludes our webinar today. Meridian Valley Lab and I would like to thank you for participating. Uh, we now have on our website, meridianvalleylab.com, a notice about our webinar for November, which is going to be presented by myself, Dr. Michael Kaplan, and it's going to talk about adrenal and thyroid synergy. It's um, also, uh, please check your email over the next few hours for a confidential survey regarding today's webinar. Your feedback is very important to us, and we want to continue to deliver informative and, and involving webinars. Thank you for your time, and have a great day.